And just while people are logging on and getting comfortable, I'll just run over a few housekeeping bits before we start the seminar properly. Uh, so you can access closed captions by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen, but you can also access fully adjustable subtitles via stream text. And my colleague Hannah is going to pop in the chat a link directly to that if you'd like to use that service. Um, as you will have heard when you logged on, we are recording um, this event and all our events will be available afterwards. And we're also going to be producing short write-ups because I know lots of people in the audience are probably thinking about their own consultation responses and might want to turn back to some of the comments made today. So we'll publish those on our website shortly. Um, Hannah's going to be tweeting from at Ada Lovelace on key points. So feel free to engage on Twitter. And just to remind everyone, although I'm sure everyone is really used to this after 18 months, but um, hopefully you can see and hear us okay. We can't see or hear you on that side of the table, but we'd be really delighted if you want to raise questions. There's a Q&A function box at the bottom. I'll be keeping an eye on that and I'll try to draw some of that together and put that into the conversation we're about to have. Um, or if you want to chat to each other, then there's also the chat function as well. So do feel free to use both of those. Okay, I think that's all the housekeeping over. So I will uh, start properly um, by welcoming you all to today's event. My name is Imogen Parker. I'm Associate Director for um, Policy at the Ada Lovelace Institute. We're an independent research institute based in London, and we've got a remit to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. And I'm really delighted to have you all um, speakers with us today. Uh, this is the second event of a series that we've crafted really to engage with the data consultation that the UK has put out um, and also scrutinise uh, some of their plans to what we're calling, you know, take back control of the GDPR. And as many people on the call will know, this is an absolutely mammoth consultation. And what we want to achieve with this event series really is to take some of those framing arguments, some of those framing assumptions and questions and explore them and scrutinise them as they're really some of the drivers to some specific ideas that have both been generated in terms of consultation questions and proposals that are being um, put forward to change data regulation in the UK. But there are also some of the arguments that justify some of those changes. So we really just want to explore those today. And the theme we're looking at is one that is not just prominent, I think, in the data consultation, but also in a lot of um, strategies coming out of government at the moment. Um, and that's around pandemic data use. And I think there's two interlocking arguments that we're hearing there. One is that the pandemic use of data has set a high watermark, which is um, what's in the national data strategy on data sharing. Um, and in the consultation, it's described as this unprecedented use of data sharing, um, which the government are seeking to maintain post-emergency, for example, through measures like making it easier for private companies to process personal data when working with public bodies for substantial public interest. And then a second, interlocked um, theme of that is that the pressure of the pandemic has really shone a light on some of the shortcomings of data regulation in the UK, uh, that the right ways to share data as they put in the consultation can be too complex to identify and apply quickly, and that some existing rules and guidance are either too vague or too prescriptive and basically ripe for reform. And there's a number of suggested proposals for clarification or for expansion of how data can be used and reused as well. So I'm really delighted to have four experts who bring, I think, different lenses and different experiences to this uh, question in terms of how data has been used in the pandemic and how it should be used in the pandemic and beyond. So we've got Sabina Leonelli, who's Professor of Philosophy and History of Science at the University of Exeter. We've got um, Edward Dove, who's a lecturer in health law and regulation at the University of Edinburgh. We've got Corrie Crider, who's the director of Foxglove and Pierre Nugent, is that the correct pronunciation? He did warn me not to try his surname beforehand. <laughs> um, Head of Insight and Innovation at the London Borough of Parking and Dagenham, so very much on the front line of some of these decisions about data sharing and um, managing the pandemic. So thank you all so much for joining us today for this discussion. I want to turn to Sabina first, if I may. Um, Sabina, based on your work on open data for research and responsible data management. I just wondered what your opening reflections are on how data has been used over the last 18 months. 
and what lessons we can draw for that. You know, is that working well? Has that been working badly? Just wanted on your opening thoughts. Many thanks, Imogen. So I guess uh, as an opening thought, it's going to be a provocative thought, which is the idea that, in fact, what we've seen happen, especially in the first year of the pandemic, was a rather narrow um, uh, trust in very, very um, specific and limited types of data sets. Uh, lots of difficulties in accessing uh, data that would actually help to contextualize what was happening, for instance, in hospitals and in transmission among the community, and um, a strong level of trust in mathematical modeling, but again, without really um, putting emphasis on which kinds of data sharing initiatives and which types of data may help to contextualize um, elements that were coming out of mathematical modeling and uh, the treatment of um, data coming out of hospitals. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think it's been very difficult, not just to find and um, venues that would provide the types of data, the breadth and um, heterogeneity of data that was required to address the pandemic, um, but also to try and find um, elements that would help to question, for instance, which kinds of causal presuppositions were put into models in the first place. So um, one of the things that we've done over the last year was collaborating within the um, Turing Institute in thinking about what were you know, the positives and the negatives of um, data science used within the pandemic. And one of the things that we found is that actually there was very little of what we may want to call data readiness. Um, there was little capacity, especially in the UK, to extract data that would be of relevance to the experience of COVID by um, different constituencies, particularly vulnerable members of the population and minorities. But also there was a dearth of data coming from medical practitioners and patient groups. And uh, in many cases, what we're looking at also was the fact that there were a lot of unusable data. And this was not necessarily due to lack of access of uh, particular implementation of data protection, but because the data weren't really, hadn't been appropriately curated. They hadn't been um, provided with the kind of information, sometimes we refer to this as metadata, that would in fact allow for this data to be effectively reused and interpreted. So what happened in situations where things worked really well, I think that's a particularly interesting um, set of examples for us to consider here. And I think the examples really uniformly, the examples we've seen of data science and data sharing working well uh, during COVID, especially in the UK, were in ways of deploying long-standing long-term data infrastructures, which involve sole element of multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary even collaborative networks as part of their governance and as part of the people that were actually uh, allowed and invited to contribute to them. So for instance, uh, there were a lot of initiatives that already existed that were devoted to sharing data about influenza that were very effectively redeployed very quickly to try and share data about COVID. And that proved to be very, very effective because the venue for this kind of data sharing, the platform, the governance structure, the different constituencies that you know, would be in a relationship of trust with each other to provide this data were already existing. So for instance, um, internationally, um, the, uh, the um, um, Global Initiative for Sharing All Influenza Data platform, which was really about sharing mostly genomic data about COVID was extremely effective and had a very uh, robust and uh, well-implemented governance structure within it. Um, the CHESS initiative within the UK uh, that was initiated by Public Health England uh, as a surveillance system for severe influenza was also very nicely readapted to share data about COVID. Another example were international venues that were already set up since many years for researchers especially to share experiences and methods around data sharing and governance. For instance, the work of the Research Data Alliance it was very important here. This is a large association of um, uh, researchers which, which work with data, uh, which they use to uh, try and share these methods and experiences. And the Research Data Alliance very quickly redeployed uh, some of its experience to produce already in June 2020 guidelines um, for how to share data effectively during the pandemic. Uh, other important infrastructures were, for instance, long-term infrastructures that um, governments had decided to support um, in, you know, in a more stable way, 
um, the UK Office for National Statistics, for instance, had a really uh, nice initiative around open data that proved to be extremely valuable during the pandemic. Um, the data log repository uh, used in uh, Edinburgh and Southeast Scotland was also an already existing service to share routine health and social care data that again was very, very effective here. And just as the last example, existing um, patient groups and lobby associations that were already used to um, share data across vast and transdisciplinary communities, including groups of patients, uh, relevant medical practitioners, researchers who actually were doing research on particular diseases. Uh, these also proved to be very, very effective uh, ways and venues to share data. So just briefly to come to three very quick conclusions. Uh, one is the idea that um, actually there were big issues with data access, but very often what proved to be a good way to address issues with data access and make more data accessible was to set up effective data governance structures that would enable people that contributed to feel that they could trust the system they were uh, providing data to. The second is the idea that actually just having access to the data didn't in any way guarantee that there would be good science or good um, innovation coming out of data reuse. What this actually meant um, was having structures that would uh, curate the data, that would provide proper venues and, and proper contextualization to the data for actually reusing them in that way. So I suppose for me, the key lesson has been that in fact, governance and responsible data practices have strengthened the scientific value and also the long-term robustness of insights extracted from data about COVID, um, as we in fact have found in many other examples. Thank you. That's great, Sabina, thanks so much. And it's uh, such a good setting the scene as well to think much more about the infrastructure and ingredients you need to make data valuable rather than just straight into the question of regulation. I did wonder whether you, in any of those models, those organisations, bumped up against issues arising from GDPR or um, one finding that we found from a, a conversation we had last summer was that sometimes it was um, the kind of lack of clarity around or a lack of confidence around GDPR and data sharing that was as much a barrier as perhaps what the regulation said. I just wonder if it, any of that kind of caused issues or whether there were any of that that made you reflect on how data, data regulation might need to evolve. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So I think the main issue really has been the interpretation that particular institutions gave to GDPR, which were generally found to be much more restrictive and conservative than the GDPR itself was. So within GDPR, the question of what constitutes appropriate data reuse is the key issue, but is very specifically left vague because the idea is that um, researchers who are dealing with the data really should themselves come up with a justification for how um, what constitutes appropriate data use. And the idea is to encourage that more critical and contextual vision of how we may then uh, make those data valuable, how we may reuse the data. And the problems very often arose from institutions like, for instance, universities who interpreted GDPR in a much more restrictive sense to just basically say, well, don't touch the data at all which in fact I think is not quite in the spirit of GDPR at all, uh, but it was done in the name of trying to avoid potential legal trouble. Thank you. Um, Edward, let me, let me bring you in here. So in the consultation, it reflects that the pandemic was sometimes a really complex time to identify lawful grounds for healthcare professionals to have oversight um, of processing. And that was getting more tricky as more and more uh, non-health bodies getting involved in personal data and in health data. I just wondered if, what your thoughts are on how practice for health data sharing has evolved over the pandemic, what you feel worked well or didn't work well when it came to health data sharing and the underpinning governance regime for that. Thanks, Imogen. And uh, I, this is actually maybe a good opportunity to pick up on several of the points uh, Sabina raised. I, I, I do want to focus in particular about governance and law here. I think in terms of what worked well is aspects of the system within health and social care have picked up in terms of speed. And I'm thinking in particular about the Health Research Authority and, and the overtime that a lot of research ethics committees put into approving projects for, for data sharing initiatives. Um, I think there were elements of the law, at least in England, uh, that were, uh, were sleeping beauty, so to speak. I'm thinking in particular about Regulation 3 of the COPI regulations, which enabled COPI notices to be developed uh, for sharing confidential patient information within the confines of that regulation. 
Um, I think in terms of issues, uh, so I think that parts of that system worked well. In terms of the law, and in particular thinking about data protection law, I would echo some of Sabina's comments. I think that, in fact, what, what worked out and what did not cause confusion by and large for the research community was the GDPR itself, but rather more convoluted, clogged governance processes rather than legal processes. And I think that's where some struggles emerged. So convoluted processes in terms of interpretation by specific entities and bodies, not because of an overly restrictive uh, data protection framework, but rather how those frameworks have been interpreted. And as part of that, I think one of the challenges is a lack of coordination of processes. And I, and I mean both across bodies and across the four nations. And of course, the challenge there is that we have a UK-wide data protection framework, but we have a common law duty of confidentiality, which is nation, nation divergent. And that's just the nature of the common law. And so we have copy rakes uh, for, for some nations, but we have a very different framework in Scotland. And so Part of that joined upness, I think, remains a problem, and that's not an, an issue that, that is solved by statutory data protection law, but is an issue of just the common law. So I think it's important to tease out governance problems versus uh, legal interpretation or legal processes per se. I think within that governance aspect, speed is not always prioritized. And I think that there sometimes can be a disconnect between public health benefit and actual data process, and that to me is a symptom of potential clogged governance processes rather than legal processes. Um, and I think just lastly, it, it's worth saying that another aspect that we haven't really considered beyond just the problem potentially of joined upness across the four nations is the international dimension. And I think you know, one of the aspects we want to think about in terms of the data protection framework and beyond is sharing data internationally. That remains, I think, a particular challenge to work through uh, in the UK GDPR and thinking about chapter five, but we might go there. But I think the main point I want to emphasize at this point is that I don't think, uh, from, from what I've heard, and again, this is more anecdotal than, than empirical, um, our concerns about the GDPR as thwarting research from taking place. And I think, if anything, uh, the UK has demonstrated success in, in navigating this framework, which I think is, is robust and, 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 and an excellent one, but more about the governance processes and, and to pick up on Sigmund's point, how, those, uh, how that legal framework is interpreted. And I think that sometimes where where, where things get clogged unnecessarily, and that's where things, things fall down. So I would focus there on within the governance aspects rather than legal aspects. Thanks, Edward. And just thinking about some of the, you know, some of the measures that have been brought in over the pandemic, I wondered whether you feel that um, any mechanisms to improve data sharing should remain post-emergency, I suppose, whether there are changes that have happened to data sharing that have made things better overall? Um. Um, well, just to take the example of, of, of the, the COPY notice under Regulation 3 of the COPY Regulations 2002, that's been extended several times and the, in the, in the latest extension now runs to the 31st of March 2022. I think it's appropriate to revisit that on a continual basis and I think each prolongation or extension rather needs to have a higher justification, um, even though technically, of course, under WHO, we are still living in the midst of a pandemic. That does speak to uh, Regulation 3, which is in the context of, of communicable diseases and, and particularly in public health emergencies, which certainly COVID-19 is. But I think we ought to consider, given the power that the copy rates uh, give to the Secretary of State and, and enable sharing a confidential patient information, which means a lifting of, of a duty, uh, an important principle of confidentiality of all of our patient data that the justification uh, will need to be high. And I think thinking more long term, absolutely a public interest test needs, needs to be at the forefront of all of these things as we come out of a pandemic and as we think about how we make use of health data, identifiable health data and confidential patient information. And um, as I say, that's a barely in at least, at least in one jurisdiction a statutory framework. Uh, in other, in other <laughs> jurisdictions like Scotland, where it's much more common law, we need to pay attention to what the public interest means. And I, I would advocate certainly for a very robust understanding of public interest, pandemic or otherwise, given the importance that we ought to put on, on health data and patient information. Thanks, Edward. Um, Corey, let me bring you in here. I know that 
an area you've been scrutinising and indeed bringing legal challenge to is around the public-private partnerships that have been emerging around the pandemic and what the relationship has been there in terms of data use. And th there's a few specific consultation changes on this front where private companies uh, might be more able to process personal data to deliver public tasks, um, proposing they can rely on the public body's lawful grounds for processing, for example. I just wondered if you could outline what you've seen in terms of, you know, what you've seen on that front and also what your view is on a need to reform the existing regulations on how private bodies work with public ones using personal data. Sure. If I could just step back for a minute and think about the broader context uh, in which all of these data systems sit. If there's a kind of general lesson that we at Foxglobe have taken away from data use in the pandemic, it's that it doesn't sit apart, it doesn't sit apart from the rest of your public health system. And that if your peep, if the population you're trying to serve don't have confidence in one or another part of that system, then actually some data measures can be self-defeating. So there's so there's actually no point in going forward with things that don't command public confidence or public trust. And the two areas that we looked the most at had to do with, as you say, things like public private, private partnerships, things that were kind of waved through, let's say, at the absolute peak of the emergency in March of 2020, but now as time wears on, and here we are in October of 2021, uh, we think show a real risk of just twisting into the permanent solution without there being anything like a democratic mandate for it. And that's where we think there needs to be absolutely much greater kind of public consultation and debate. And we've brought a series, you know, with open democracy of legal challenges relating to one particular data aggregation system. So I won't, I won't bore you with the ins and the outs of our legal challenges, but basically um, you will be, most of the people on this call will probably be familiar with the uh, COVID data store, which was the largest amalgamation of patient data, as I understand in the NHS's history. Uh, and it was managed in part by a series of private companies, uh, including in, of particular concern to us, uh, a, a defense contractor called Palantir out of the United States. Uh, we were very concerned about the potential knock-on effects to public trust of involving a company like Palantir at the absolute heart of health service infrastructure in particular. I mean, these guys have had government contracts for a long time, but they've tended to be with, as it were, GCHQ or border forces rather than in healthcare. Uh, and we were extremely concerned, I mean, of course, about the lawful basis for processing and about exactly what Palantir was and wasn't doing, but actually more generally about what kind of signal it sent to uh, at-risk communities in the United Kingdom that they were involving a company such as Palantir, whose job is mainly in surveillance, border forces, predictive policing, historically, uh, in the health service, and whether that wasn't going to be self-defeating. You will remember, I mean, we're all old enough to remember the beginning of this year and the government's campaigns, for example, around vaccine hesitancy in the undocumented migrant population, where people had to go forward and say, hey, don't worry, you can come in and get your jab and we're not going to dob you into the home office. Don't worry about the stories that you've heard about NHS home office data sharing. So I think that's that, right? It's just a really classic and crystalline example of how data governance, which is one of the least sexy phrases in the English language, actually has a real effect on your public health objectives. We were deaf. I'm, I'm in Brixton here, right? I, I'm in central Brixton at the moment where the uh, still, right? At this moment, the, the level of second jab uptake in this community is running about, I think, I don't have the dashboard open in front of me, but about 20 points behind the national average. And again, that's because of reasons of community confidence in government and in these systems and community trust. So anyway, back to, back to Palantir. Uh, we've brought a couple of, of legal challenges around publication of the contracts and around speaking to communities uh, before these emergency systems, because everyone's prepared, I think, to give the government a lot of leeway and slack during an emergency. And the question is, what do we do now that we're kind of emerging from that? Uh, what needs to happen before we kind of emerge into this steady state where this is not a pandemic, but I suppose just endemic? And we've basically said, look, you've actually got to talk to people, not just not just to do with the GDPR, but actually to do with a bunch of governing statutes around the NHS, the NHS Act itself. Um, so, that, so that I think is the question. I, I, in terms of is it broken? Do we need to fix it vis-a-vis -vis the GDPR? I mean, uh, I come from a community of people who would say that actually many of the norms that we have around the GDPR are slightly observed in the breach in any event. Uh, and so the idea that we need to create a whole bunch of additional loopholes for various purposes that aren't always that well made out in the papers, uh, I would be slightly skeptical of. And again, I, 
just to close with a final thought about the way that these data systems actually really sit in society, uh, I would point to something that wasn't explicitly a pandemic system, but that kind of tried to go through under the banner of the pandemic, and then everybody kind of threw their toys out of the pram, which was, of course, the, the general practice uh, system that they sought to put through in May and June of this year, which was basically seeking to pull all of 55 million patients in England GP data into a permanent data lake. I do have the dashboard for that open in front of me, and the national data opt-out uh, system now shows that in May and June, the effective rate of opt-outs in England from that system doubled. So you've got about, I think, over 3 million people now have opted out of that system. Uh, and unless the government is basically proposing to turn around and say, actually, people don't have a say in what happens to their patient record, which I just think is a political non-starter, uh, I think that's a pretty good signal of where the democracy is in this. And if people think that the pandemic means that people have lost interest in or care about what happens to their patient data, I think that the experience with GPDPR shows that that's actually just not true. Uh, and so people are going to need to go very carefully explaining to people exactly what the kind of pluses and minuses are. And those people, the people who opted out, I don't, some of them, of course, were concerned about their privacy and about the individuality of their patient record. I don't know, fertility issues, alcoholism, abuse, what have you. But actually, I think a huge number of them from the incoming we got into Fox Clips inbox during another legal challenge, uh, were actually concerned about the relationship between the state and the private sector. They were concerned about a number of companies coming in and potentially exploiting the NHS uh, and kind of freeloading essentially off of what had been a really potentially valuable publicly funded data asset. And so I don't think it will be, I don't think it will be useful going forward for the government to intone further three word slogans like data saves lives and assume that that's going to end the debate uh, and going to remove people's concerns uh, about exactly what's going to happen to things like their medical data. I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Corey. Um, I've also seen there's a couple of really great questions coming in, in the chat and Q&A. Do feel free to add um, more, but now I'd like to turn to PA, who of course was very much, you know, you're on the front line of using data during the pandemic in Barking and Dagenham. And, you know, Ada um, spent some time last summer uh, conducting an ethnographic piece of research, really exploring some of the data practices and how the council was using data to respond to the pandemic. And, really some fascinating findings that are um that have kind of come out of that work and where Barking and Dagenham you know have an in-house data science team which is unusual in local authorities so actually in terms of this not you know being an in-house set of tools um I just wondered if you could share some of your reflections both on um what you did with data over the pandemic but I think also more importantly what your understanding was was GDPR or you know what where there were hang-ups where there were hold-ups or where things were eased for you and really thinking about whether that governance regime was fit for purpose from your perspective. Thanks Imogen um, uh, and, and, and thanks for, to all the other um, panelists for some really interesting points as well so um, my name is Pierre I'm uh, head of Insight and Innovation at Barking Dagnum Council. And basically, this has been my life for the past 18 months. And um, uh, looking after um, 214,000 residents in, in uh, the East End of London, um, London's most deprived um, community uh, as well, um, where there are um, pre-existing health inequalities um, that are startling. So um, one thing that uh, I often say is um, it takes 77 minutes to go from um, on the district line from Richmond to Barking. Um, uh, but the difference between those two London boroughs in terms of uh, healthy life expectancy is 11 years. So um, uh, the uh, and, and that that is alarming uh, in the same city that we have that level of of health inequality and that was before the pandemic um so when the pandemic started uh i, I lead a team of data scientists behavioral scientists service designers we we are all in house um uh, we had uh, uh an opportunity before the lockdown um to attempt to understand the scale of vulnerability that exists in our borough and how many people would um, 
you know likely be to to need to shield and those were terms that were brand new um, to us at the time um, and I think part of our success in that uh, coming to an answer for that so I remember vividly the 16th of March um, 9 a.m. in the morning the the leader of the council called me in with a group of other uh, council officers and said council the, the country is very likely to go into lockdown what you know what can we do what can, information do we have uh, that could help us support the most vulnerable people and um, by two o'clock that same day um, in the town hall chambers we had about 40 community and voluntary groups had all come together and galvanized and uh, motivated to, to, to support um, the most vulnerable so between sort of 9 a.m to two o'clock it was mine and my team's job to attempt to put a, a, a figure to that scale um, and so, so we we ran some um, uh, analysis based interestingly on existing long-term systems uh, and partnerships that we have with our health partners something that um, Sabina um, uh, mentioned uh, and we basically said look in we, we think that there's about um, uh, I remember the exact figure actually 11,753 people that could be vulnerable clinically vulnerable um, uh, and um, fast forward about I think somewhere between four to six weeks later uh, when the government actually gave official data sets um, uh, the, our first shielding list had about twelve and a half thousand people on it so we were about kind of ninety four five percent there with our um, uh, analysis of like the the, 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 the the potential scale but that buys a lot of time in terms of um, galvanizing your resources to respond to that um, to um, uh, to kind of motivate your volunteering groups motivate your food banks all of those sort of things um, so, so data in that sense kind of helps you to in that crisis mode really bought us time to prepare um, and 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 so the, the kind of the transition of of what we did into sort of this conversation is I think I probably start by saying that data has this um, it has this gravitational pull and it pulls lots of things together um, and so in my head it pulls together kind of governance and sort of legal frameworks but it also pulls together issues regarding ethics and issues regarding transparency and in a crisis situation we had to think about all of those things simultaneously all in one go um, whilst also responding to um, the, the needs of vulnerable people whilst also making sure you know um, our social workers had the right information to continue their visits whilst also making sure that people had food parcels on time and and people who had requested a food parcel um, and and it's and it's delivery wasn't um, uh, there wasn't a mistake in that and, all, and so there was just this kind of like all everything happening at the same time but going back to this point of data having this gravitational pull um, what we had to do at the time was if I, if I just look at kind of governance and legal frameworks in the three components that I've, what I've spoken about one thing we had to acknowledge and remind ourselves as well is that what, where do the statutory duties of local authorities already exist so we have a statutory duty to look after people in social care. We already have a statutory duty to um, share data about um, uh, children who have vulnerabilities or, uh, or parts of it, safeguarding, etc. So in those instances, what we had to do was um, not forget. You know, so GDPR isn't the only legal framework in which we can share data, and, uh, or for local authorities to share data. And um, we had to we had to make sure that. The things that we were doing are actually part of existing um, uh, uh, legal frameworks and at the same time have um, conversations with people across the local partnership ecosystem whom in I'm, I'm not speaking necessarily for myself or Barking Dagenham when I say this but I think it's potentially representative of lots of other data professionals in in um, local government so that might have been the first time you've actually spoken to uh, your counterpart in a, in a clinical commissioning group um, you've never had that relationship before um, uh, uh, the panelists before have talked about 
existing relationships and trust and things like that. And so something like, you know, we, for a lot of us in the 350 local authorities in, in, in England, a lot of us were having that person that we were talking to about data sharing in the clinical commissioning group or your health partner. That was the first time we've ever had that conversation. And we have to very quickly come to terms with finding out the legal way to do something, the ethical way to do something, the transparent way to do something in a first conversation. Um, so attempting to do all of that uh, in a crisis situation is really challenging. But I think what we lent on was um, where our existing relationships and trust had already been built and where there were existing legal frameworks that enable us to, to um, provide support to the most vulnerable. Um, we, we, we had to do that quickly. So it's one thing that we talked a lot about was we had to think big, um, but start small and act fast. And um, all of those sort of things that we did, we have to kind of fit into that criteria to make sure the people that really needed us at most um, got it. And we, and embarking in Dagenham, I think I'll, I'll end on this point. Um, on Barking, in Barking Dagenham, um, we were one of the few local authorities that did not have to um, uh, utilise the government's um, social care easement. Uh, I'm quite sure if it was a policy procedure. So, um, what what happened during the pandemic was a lot of people who really needed support couldn't get support because the gateway into support is through social care. So government eased particular procedures like financial assessments, et cetera, so that vulnerable people could get into social care quicker. What we did not have to do in Barking and Dagenham was utilize that procedure. We could have, but we didn't have to utilize that procedure because our community response with our local e partner ecosystem and our community and voluntary groups was strong enough to keep the demand away from statutory services and it meant that our social workers who were informed with the right data and tools to continue to to support those people that they need to support had the time to do so and i'm going to pause there thanks so much pa that's just just one quick follow-up question i mean really appreciate the challenge of under pressure in an emergency, having these initial conversations and trying to get your head around the right legal frameworks and approaches. I wondered there whether what you found challenging was what perhaps some of the others have picked up on, on in terms of process around GDPR and also kind of clarity on duties and responsibilities. I shouldn't just say GDPR, as you say, and other bits of relevant legislation. Or were there any bits where you felt you really bumped up against issues? with data regulation where you weren't able to access the data that you needed or where there was, you know, whether that was really causing issues in terms of getting at pace to the sort of, the sort of information that you needed. Um, I think um, the way that I answer that is probably just make a distinction between um, two roles in, a, in, a, in an average local authority. Um, so in a local authority, we will always have a Caldicott guardian. They are responsible for the sharing of health data between local authority and um, uh, and the health system. Uh, now, in nearly all cases, your Caldicott guardian tends to be your director of public health, and um, you don't really need to guess very hard about you know who is the busiest person at the at the time, right? So you know, getting your Caldicott guardian to then who is also your director of public health, who is the busiest person during a pandemic to be informed, cited, etc., to sign off on things is, is always a challenge. Then there's, then there's um, your data protection officer. So your data protection officer um, will have um, oversight and understanding of all the different legal frameworks, but they will probably be your, your, um, the person who has the greatest level of expertise around GDPR in, in an organization. In local government, now we we are we in Barking and Dagenham are are um, uh, it, advent, it's advantageous that we have an in-house DPO, um, and our Caldicott guardian is also our, our, our director of public health. In lots of local authorities, the DPO is a shared role across a different local system, because um, 
legislation allows for that to be, you don't have to have an in-house DPO. In Barking and Dagenham, we do. And that's a very, very busy person at that in the middle of a pandemic as well. So on, so you've, um, whilst we don't have um, challenges in accessing the data because of our long-term pre-existing relationships, um, what was a bit of a challenge was the two people who can sign off on important documents like data sharing and data protection, impact assessments and ethical workbooks and all of those things in the middle of the pandemic are the most um, sought after and bu busiest people of all time. Um, so if there's a point to be kind of raised about structures of governance, pandemic or not, there is something that we need to think about uh, around who in your organization um, or, or, or how or how does accountability exist in your organization that is not um, solely attributed and attached to two specific roles? You know, as I said, during a pandemic, very hard to get a hold of those people in the first place. So where, where can we create um, structures of governance within organizations where um, uh, uh, sort of DPO rights can be shared across three or four people instead of one individual uh, or Caldecott guardian rights can be shared across three or four people instead of one you know those sorts of um, things I think is is something that legislation doesn't quite cover but in practice um, we we need um, to, to, to localize what um, those governance structures uh, mean in our organizations uh, much more effectively so much that's such a I like how many points have come through that are really about the kind of practicalities and the infrastructure and the gatekeeping and you know these points where it's not simply a case of you know, what is permitted under law or what isn't permitted it's actually all the other things about the quality of the data is access and everything else there's a number of really great questions coming in do feel free to add others but I just want to pick up one that came in on the chat which was pointed at Sabina but I think is really really everyone could speak to on um, the questions about issues of trust. Um, so I think Maria says, some studies showed during the first wave, people would have more trust in Google and Apple platforms when it comes to things like contact tracing um, and sharing personal records than in public health institutions in the context of a surveillance narrative and of sensitive data such as health records. What's the main cause of that? And I wonder if actually we can open that up around really thinking through where trust lies and what data and governance you need around that. But Selina, shall I turn to you first? And then if anybody else wants to come in, do feel free. Thank you very much. So I guess, of course, one interpretation for that kind of result is the idea that uh, people didn't really perceive this to be additional data sharing, right? These were companies that by and large already owned a lot of personal data. And so uh, if, if that could provide a solution that would involve um, avoiding additional data sharing towards the government, for instance, uh, that would have been favored as a solution. Of course, one has to really stress, and it came out also in other questions, that this wasn't the case um, across. So we've seen several uh, cases of countries where people had very different perceptions of where risks lie in, in terms of surveillance. In Denmark, for instance, uh, attempts to actually um, share data directly with public health authorities were much more successful. Uh, the other thing I think that's important to point out in terms of trust is um, what happens once people start to experience the implications of assigning trust in particular ways when it comes to data sharing. I think it became uh, pretty clear um, a few months after the uh, contact tracing systems that was set up um, in collaboration with Google and Apple was, uh, was launched, where it became very clear to many people across the country that adopted this system, that because the system was set up to be completely separate from any part of the medical system or public health, this actually meant that uh, very often the signaling that one would get from that system were pretty useless, or anyhow, there was very little ways in which that would connect with any sort of support or assistance from the state or for medical services. And this was quite different in countries that actually invested a bit more time in trying to put together a system of data sharing and contact tracing that actually did not, 
did not use uh, the Google Apple platform, but was um, you know, resorting to um, basically in-house already existing systems that were tweaking that respect. For instance, in France, there was a lot of um, effort together with international experts in data sharing in thinking about how one could devise a contact tracing system where there would be some contact, some sharing of data with some select parts of the public health service specifically geared towards actually supporting people that were receiving notifications saying you may have come in contact with somebody that was uh, COVID positive and so on and so forth, right, to self-isolate. And that actually it potentially turned out to be associated with higher levels of trust in the longer run because there was a sense in which particular decision around data sharing actually had visible repercussions uh, in people's lives, while the decision to trust a private company that in fact had no intersection medical services turned out to mean no assistance for anybody who may require it. Sorry, Pat, we can turn to you just picking up that trust theme. I mean, do you think that the kind of trust between private sector and public sector is you know, are kind of fundamentally different? Do you think that we've got the right regulatory system and enforcement system to make sure that data used by private and public sector are fit for purpose and you know, trustworthy? I think it's so contextual, isn't it, right? I mean, I, the one thing I like about Sabina's point is that she's talking about a trust that, had, that that often is a little bit more localized, like people are participating in, I mean, to, to give an, an anecdote about my own experience with contact tracing after I got pinged, um, I, had two, I had two kind of parallel experiences with two different sets of contact tracers. Basically, I live in a local authority that was piloting doing it locally itself. And so I had a lovely chat with a man kind of down the road from me about our local community and the coffee shop that I had been to, et cetera. And I, and I kind of engaged with that in a relatively open way. And then I got called by Circo uh, afterwards, <laughs> who obviously had their metrics that they needed to fill. Uh, and it was a very different, it was a very different experience. Now, you know, it's an anecdote, it's not data, but I think there's something there. And one of the things that we've been thinking about in terms of governance and how to kind of go forward out of the pandemic with something that, as it were, gives researchers and planners what they need in a health data context, doesn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, but does have democratic assent and can command uh, public confidence is this idea that maybe, maybe trust doesn't scale brilliantly. Maybe governance doesn't scale super brilliantly. And actually there's something to be said for trying to create, and you know, people, this has been done, right? I mean, you've got the kind of one London effort and with some kinds of health data sharing, you've got the great North care record. People have experimented with this even before the pandemic, but I think there's something to be said. And we're, and we're kind of talking to academics about this and trying to produce something that is a little bit more locally responsive uh, to, pe to people like Pie, uh, you know, maybe, so, so, I don't know, something like a school board where you've got a blended grouping of people who are, yes, uh, health practitioners, yes, academics, yes, data experts, but also possibly a local, you know, a local politician or politicians who could be thrown out of your ear, thrown out on their ear if there is a misuse that really outrages everybody in the community. Something that's just a bit more responsive than, let's say, you know, the national government will be over issues of data governance because people, people obviously voting for national elections are engaging in a whole bunch of different kind of things that they're balancing. They're not just thinking about this and that actually making it more kind of locally democratically responsive might be an answer. I don't know if that's, I don't, that doesn't answer the question about public versus private. I mean, I think, I think there are, con I think I would simply say that there are contexts in which trust in both institutions is currently running pretty low. And there's been lots of enthusiastic nodding on the idea of local around the screen on local, uh, yeah, more localised. Yeah, do you want to come in on that as very local? Yeah, please, if you want. I, I really loved what Corey just said. Um, uh, 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 and um, I, I, I'd hope that there's, you know, there's greater trust in local um, people, tools, systems, communities, etc. And being part of a local government, I certainly feel that. And there is there is a, a difference in levels of trust between Kind of your, your most the, the the most local authorities versus um, central and regional ones, and 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 Edward touched on that as well about kind of the difference between those devolved authorities across the the nation. Um, but uh, I I just wanted to kind of give what I think is an important point about trust and accountability, just to build on what Corey said. So my job, uh, my job title is head of insight and innovation. My responsibilities are around. Um, you know, um, data science, analytics, all those things. But I have a, a, a political um, 
uh, portfolio lead whom I report to. So I report to, at, at an, I'm not a politician, so as an officer, I report to my executive leadership. But I, I report to a political portfolio. Um, and that portfolio is entitled Community Leadership and Community Engagement. And uh, on the face of it, it might not look, it might not sound like the type of thing that a data professional should report into, but it is absolutely the right thing to do because it is because of my handling on my team's handling um, of our residents' data that um, officers and others and community actors, et cetera, can do outreach work to the people that most need it. So therefore, it is right that I report to um, an accountable uh, local um, um, political member because um, it adds a layer of scrutiny and a, la and a layer of um, responsibility that, other that doesn't exist if you merely outsource um, that responsibility out to um, uh, uh, the private sector or elsewhere. Um, so it's just going back to these sort of like localized governance models is that uh, I, I, I believe or I hope that there, there is greater trust in local institutions. I know for a fact that when I look at the resident survey and the results of the resident survey in Barking and Dagenham and, ac and across um, lots of residents um, surveys in, 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 in the nation, um, we always find this kind of very paradoxical moment. There's two questions in the resident survey. One that says, um, uh, what, you know, what, do you, what do you think of the place in which you live? And what do you think of the council, you know, your local authority? And um, nearly all the time, the trend for the resident survey has been, what do you think of the place that you live in? Has always been very positive. And it's, 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 in Barking and Dagenham, it's always been a, um, a positive response. But then what do you think of your your council is often construed in quite a negative way. And the reason why that's quite, um, and that's probably because of people think of the council as people who fill potholes or miss your bins or you pay council tax to and things. So they're kind of always negative frames and the way we, it's probably our own fault for asking those questions in that in that way. But the reality is that your local council is is responsible, legally responsible for place shaping. So in, if you if you answer in a way that is, I really love the place in which I live, you're actually saying that I love the what I love what my council has done. But when you explicitly ask about what do you what you know um, what's your views of the council, you seem to, you, you see have this sort of um, uh, negative relationship. Um, um, but for, but for, but for me, like the, the reason why I kind of say that is, we see, I I think what we've learned out of the pandemic is that collective action at a local level has built an even greater level of trust and community cohesion. When I look at data on community cohesion, um, community integration, all of those things in Embarking Dagenham, they've actually got stronger as a result of the pandemic. Um, and uh, the, the pandemic has actually favored uh, uh, those things. So this rethinking or recalibrating of what does trust look like at a local level I think is a useful thing um, and it absolutely sits very dearly to my heart. Thanks, PA. Um, a question that's coming kind of flips the telescope a little bit and um, I wondered whether Edward, you might want to come in on this, asking what good practice of data sharing and good governance and law can be learned from other countries and whether or not, you know, the UK are getting it right in comparison to other countries, particularly in GDPR, other GDPR countries. I mean, Edward, I don't know if you want to come in on that or other speakers as well. There's also a couple of questions, PA, in the chat that you might want to answer directly. Um, <laughs> I might struggle to that, <laughs> to answering that, uh, not, not being an expert in other jurisdictions, including other uh, well, uh, well, member states of the European Union or EEA. Um, I, I would say, though, um, it, it is my view that the UK um, demonstrates, all, by and large, world leadership in, in ethical research and well-regulated research. Certainly, I'm far from perfect, but I think, I think it is world-leading in a lot of ways, and I think that is precisely because of a strong regulatory framework. And I think that is partly what 
what supports and sustains public trust. And therefore, I think there ought to be some concern if the edifice of a strong regulatory framework and what, what I think is actually a, a, an overall proportionate regulatory framework, um, if, if that is modified, given that it's actually quite recently uh, uh, built up and enacted, but that could have a lot of repercussions, including for public trust, including the concerns about scaling up trust and scaling up data, particularly in the context of, of public health research. So um, as far as large scale governance processes go, again, I think in terms of regulation, thinking in particular in the health research context, we're very fortunate to have a robust body like the Health Research Authority, uh, I would say a, a drugs regulator like the MHRA, um, I think an overall good regular with data protection with the ICO, um, you know, and I think part of the challenge is navigating different sorts of legal regimes, including common law duty of confidentiality, including obligations to respect one's right to privacy under the European Convention on Human Rights, which applies here, and as well as data protection law. And that's complex, but I think the balance overall in terms of the regulatory framework is well thought through. Um, as I say, I think the challenge is the interpretation of it all, working, it, working its way through the decisions on the ground. And it's, it's sometimes the inconsistency and, and a, an interpretation that might not be the best that actually is where the challenges lie and having a joined up approach across institutions and across the four nations. And again, that's not merely a data protection concern. I think that that's where challenges lie, but actually I think as a comparator, without being an expert uh, in, in the regimes in other countries, be it in the EU or beyond. I think the UK has done an exceptional job and that's something actually that should be taken as momentum to keep things going forward rather than to, than to uh, undertake a, a, a bold new approach, which I actually think might not be the best pass, path forward coming out of the pandemic. Thank you so much. I think that's a great closing closing challenge for us. Um, to kind of keep momentum, but not um, not lose some areas in which we have been perhaps world leading. Again, drawing words directly from the government's own data strategy. Um, I'd like we're out of time, so I'd just like to thank our panelists so much for taking the time to join us this late lunchtime. Hugely appreciate your comments. As I said, we will be um, putting the video up on our website. We'll do a short um, a short summary if anybody here thinks you know wants to draw on any of that content for their own consultation responses i know that a lot of people will have found that immensely valuable uh we've got one more we've got another three events coming up the next one is scheduled for next wednesday 20th of october on at 2 p.m and that's going to focus on accountable ai as a kind of big thematic priority um in the uh consultation document so if you're interested in that do um, register, that's available on our website and join us again next week. Thank you all so much, take care.